Welcome back. Before we jump into this episode, I want to quickly revisit the topic of the last episode, which was all about the rake on GG Poker. Now, in that episode, I mainly focused on the rake that the average player on GG is paying, but a couple of people did correctly point out that I didn't explicitly mention that GG's rakeback systems do give you much better rakeback if you grind a ton of volume. So if you just play an absurd number of hands and you do manage to get to the top of these leaderboards, you can end up getting like 50% rake back or even more. And I think that this does work for some people, particularly people who are able to manage many tables at once and also who are able to just kind of chain themselves to the chair and just put in a lot of hours. But a lot of players that I speak to find this approach to poker to be very depressing and to just not work for them. I think that a lot of people who attempt to get to the top of these leaderboards just end up burning out rather quickly. I've also noticed just anecdotally in my coaching that players who just put in tons of volume, like 50 to 100,000 hands per month, they find that it's really hard to improve. You really just don't have the time to put deep thought into any given hand. You might get put in a really interesting spot and then you get stacked, but you don't have time to think about that because it's just on to your next hand and one of the 20 tables that you have open. And you're often putting in so many hours that you have far fewer hours left over to spend studying at the end of the day. So I think that when you're just grinding for rig back like this, it is pretty easy to stagnate. Another point about the last episode is that it's also interesting to see so many poker players continuing to play on GG, despite the fact that based on my calculations, a lot of other sites appear to be a better value if you're looking at the average win rate of regulars on those sites. Of course, this is post rake back. And I think there are many reasons for this. At really high stakes, I think the main reason is just that GG has taken up almost all of the action. So if you're talking about 25, 50 plus, it's m m the vast majority of the traffic is happening on GG. And those games these days on Poker Stars almost never run. On Party Poker, they almost never run, from what I can tell. Um, on ACR, you have a decent amount of high stakes, and it seems like on coin poker, like as of very recently, you have some high stakes action happening there, although it's unclear how long that's going to last. But generally speaking, if you're a really high stakes player and you're unhappy with GG Poker's rake, it's kind of tough because there's not really anywhere else to play. I think that another reason could be that the rake system is not totally transparent on GG, so maybe people would try other alternatives if they fully did the math and realized how much rake that they were paying. But because you have all these weird systems like PVI and rake happening pre-flop and, and bad B jackpots, all of these things make it harder to calculate how much rake you're actually paying on GG, which is one thing that I really don't like about that site. But I think the fact that players continue to play on GG even at lower stakes could say something about the revealed preferences of poker players. Revealed preferences, if you're not familiar with that concept, it's basically talking about inferring what people want by their actual actions rather than what they say that they want. So why would people continue to play on GG even though they're paying more rake and and potentially just cutting into their profits. Well, one reason for that would be they perceive GG to be safer. Perhaps many poker players desire to reduce variance to such an extent that they would actually prefer to give up some of their profits in order to have this steady stream of rake back coming in every single month. So it's a very interesting topic and I'm sure we could fill in a whole other episode about GG Poker and its rake system. Maybe we'll revisit this topic again in a future episode. But today we're going to discuss a different topic entirely, which is selection bias. Selection bias happens when the data that you choose to study doesn't truly represent the larger data set that you're trying to understand. This can lead you to incorrect conclusions because the information that you have is not a fair 
or accurate picture of the whole situation. In my experience in this day and age, many poker players understand variance and how to run a variance calculation, but what they don't have a very good understanding of is selection bias. And if you don't understand selection bias, it can really warp your interpretation of variance. So even though you might actually do a proper variance calculation, you will misinterpret the results and think that something is wrong when it's actually just normal variance. There are three typical traps with selection bias that I see players fall into over and over and over again. The first trap is selection bias in the win rates of large groups of players. In other words, this means comparing the results of poker players without the proper context. We typically run variance calculations as individuals, but we rarely run variance calculations for large groups of players. And when you study large numbers of poker players, you will find players who run extremely well or extremely poorly, even in the long term, even over hundreds of thousands or, or a million hands. So let me give you an example of that. Imagine that you are a three big blind per hundred winner and you play 500,000 hands. A fairly simple variance calculation will tell you that your probability of losing over that entire sample is only around 2%. So if you're a three big blind per hundred winner, which is a moderate win rate, it's definitely actually better than average. The average poker player online post rig back and all rewards is usually breaking even or making about a big blind per hundred. It's only on the softest sites that you see players winning on average at a win rate of three big blinds per hundred or more. So if you win at three big blinds per hundred, you play 500,000 hands, 49 times out of 50, you're going to make money over that sample. And most people who have moderate win rates will never experience in their life losing over such a large stretch of hands. It's just simply too difficult to play enough hands that it makes it likely that you will encounter a break-even stretch of that extent. But if you look at a group of, say, 250 poker players, and they all play 500,000 hands each, it's almost certain that at least one of them will lose over that sample. And when you think about how many poker players there are, it's far more than 250, it's pretty scary to think about just how unlucky the unluckiest players in history have probably been. On the flip side, some professional players have been extremely lucky in their career, and it gives the public a very skewed perception of how skilled they actually are. This is particularly true at very high stakes, where fewer hands are played and variance plays a larger role in the outcomes. One thing I've noticed as a coach is that when faced with truly extreme variance, people will usually try to explain the results with something they did. People just have an incredibly hard time accepting that they were one of those people who got extremely lucky or extremely unlucky over a very long period of time. Of course, we've all probably heard of someone, especially recreational players, who just claim to be the most unlucky person in the world. Um, <laughs> those are not really the people that I'm talking about. People I'm talking about are the serious pros who seem to be doing everything correctly, but just like pretty much always seem to be hovering around a below average win rate and never seem to really break out in their career and flourish. I think that there are also some of these abnormally unlucky people who would have had a very profitable poker career, but they started on such a negative streak of variance that they were just never able to really get their footing in poker. Imagine if the first 500,000 hands that you played in poker, you lost, even though your true win rate was actually significantly positive. I feel like very few people would be internally motivated enough to continue playing poker in that scenario, and they would just give up. Let's take a quick break so I can tell you about my program, the Mobius GTO Stat Checker which is now available for both MTTs and cash games. This program automatically compares your stats to solver data and pinpoints where you're off track, color coding your stats to show you where you're too passive or too aggressive compared to GTO. You can also use this program 
to analyze your opponent's tendencies and exploit their mistakes. For example, you can easily figure out how often your pool is bluffing on the river and therefore how often you should be bluff catching. Plus, it's great for evaluating the quality of your games. You can check the average win rate of the regulars in your pool or see how many hands in your database were played by recreational players. The Mobius GTO Stat Checker takes the guesswork out of your study routine so you can focus on fixing your leaks and exploiting the leaks of your opponents. This course includes video modules to walk you through how to use the program and a support channel to make sure that you never get stuck. You can click the link in the show notes to learn more about the Stat Checker and purchase a copy for MTTs or cash games today. So that's the first trap, is the selection bias in win rates of large groups of players. The second trap is selection bias in the win rates of large groups of database statistics. If you study a large number of statistics in your database, you are very likely to find specific scenarios where you drastically underperform or overperform in your win rate. For example, opening from the cutoff versus other positions, or playing three bet pots at a position, or even playing on one site or one stake versus another. You might be one of those people who just has like incredible results on party poker, but just can't seem to win on poker stars no matter what you do. And you run the variance calculations and you calculate that the odds of this being just luck are like one in a hundred or, or maybe even less than that. And you conclude that I must be doing something wrong on this site, or there must be some issue with this site that I'm not seeing. And the other site must be better for some reason that I'm not seeing. But what you forgot to factor in was that you basically selected for an anomaly when you decided to go into your database and look for specific scenarios where you were drastically underperforming. So another way to put this is, imagine if I came to you and I said, yesterday I flipped a coin and I flipped heads 10 times in a row. And you might think, wow, flipping heads 10 times in a row, that's like one in a thousand. That's incredibly unlikely. But what if I told you that I flipped that coin a thousand times and within that entire sample, I just happened to get 10 heads in a row. Now that's a much different story. So the best way to combat this is to, first of all, try not to analyze your statistics by win rate unless you are ready to take those results with a huge grain of salt. And if you decide to analyze your database statistics by win rate, then what you need to do if you do find an anomaly is ask yourself what would need to be true for these results to actually make sense. Okay, so you should have relevant data to back up the win rate results that you're seeing. For example, if your win rate in three bed pots is terrible, and you're also folding the turn 60 plus percent of the time in three bed pots, and you're getting destroyed in red line, then you probably do need to work on three bed pots. However, you could have reached this conclusion just by looking at the stats beforehand. This is how I do database reviews, it's how my stat checker works. You don't actually need to look at your win rate in a specific zone. You need to look at, are your frequencies in line? Is your range composition sound? And if you review hands, do those hands appear solid or do they reveal a bunch of huge blunders? But looking at your win rate in specific spots and trying to use that to find leaks, in my opinion, is usually putting the cart before the horse. One last thing I'll say about this is that it is, in my experience coaching, one of the, the last things that players will do uh, when they're really spinning out. I've personally coached hundreds of players at this point, and I've been in contact with many more than that. And so I've seen this many times now where a player will be struggling. They will maybe even be on the verge of quitting poker. And almost as like a last-ditch effort, they start to scour their database to find specific scenarios where they're losing money. And this doesn't even always have to be somebody who is on the verge of quitting poker. It can also be a winning player who is just on a really severe downswing. But anytime this happens with a student, I really try to sit them down and give them some perspective because it's a symptom that 
they're sort of spiraling because this is not a logical way to study and progress and improve in poker, at least not in the way that people typically approach it. The third and final trap is selection bias in the win rates of large numbers of samples. This is similar to the first trap, but rather than comparing the results of many players, you compare your own results, but you're just slicing your own sample into many, many individual samples, and you're comparing that. If you arbitrarily slice up your samples, you are very likely to find huge anomalies in your win rate. We always see this when players go on a huge downswing. They'll look at their sample from peak to trough. So for example, they might say, I lost 43 buy-ins in the last 33,000 hands. But why are you looking at the last 33,000 hands? It's a completely arbitrary sample. So instead of doing this, I recommend trying not to put any stock in your results when you check your results over irregular intervals. Instead, try to check your results every 50,000 or even better, every 100,000 hands. If you're a tournament player, there's going to be like substantially even more variance than this. So you should check your results even less often. If you're a live poker player, you're going to be getting way less hands, but your win rate's also going to be a lot higher. So you can check far fewer hands to get a statistically significant sample. And just like I said earlier, if you do have a really bad sample, but you're a winning player, try to think about why that might happen. Like, what are the plausible reasons for a sample like this happening? And I think what you'll find is like the vast, vast majority of the time, the only plausible explanation is variance. Unless you switch something up drastically or your pool composition changed drastically, there's usually no reason why you, a good winning player, would suddenly start losing at the rate of a recreational player. Um, most of the time, it's just variance, and you have to accept that and just focus on making small incremental improvements to your game. Another way that I've put this in a past article in my blog is that imagine if you go on a 20 buy-in downswing. That is 2,000 big blinds. Now, it's pretty hard to even punt like a few big blinds in a single hand. And it's truly rare to see a professional poker player punt more than 10 big blinds in a single hand. And by that, I mean the EV of the play at equilibrium. So it's truly a feat to punt more than 10 big blinds in a single hand. But if you went on a 20 buy-in downswing, that's 2,000 big blinds. So you would have had to have made 200 mistakes of that size in order to actually lose the amount that you lost. Did you actually make 200 severe blunders or did you just run bad? Well, in most cases, pretty much every case, the answer is that you ran bad. So whether you're comparing your results to others or you're hunting for leaks in your own database, or you're looking at your win rate over a recent sample of hands that you played, always come back to this concept of selection bias and how it could be impacting the data that you're trying to interpret. That's a wrap for this episode. Thank you guys for tuning in. If you enjoyed it, please subscribe to the podcast so you won't miss any future episodes. Your support means a lot. Until next time, good luck at the tables.